Merry meet, good friend. Today I shall be attempting to reinterpret the princess's red gown from this painting entitled St. George Slaying the Dragon. It's dated to around 1450, so I'm really excited to get to explore some late medieval dressmaking techniques. First and foremost, I must disclaim that since I was working off of a painted reference instead of an extant garment pattern, there was definitely a fair amount of interpretation on my end of the process. Especially when we get into the land of sleeves in part two of this video series. While in general I always strive to back up my claims with historical evidence, I cannot claim complete historical authenticity on this project, if only because we have now entered a distant realm of time in which so little evidence actually remains to us. I'm going to do my best to point out any areas of debate or uncertainty, and as always, please do feel free to chime in at the comment section down below if you have any other additional insight. Now on to the sewing! For the basic pattern, I mainly used for reference one of the few surviving tunics from the period, a woman's gown discovered in Herjulfsnes, Greenland in the late 14th to early 15th century. It consists of center front and back panels, and four slim side panels cut to shape snugly round the upper body. These panels flare out substantially towards the hem in wide gores to give a very full skirt, a silhouette that is prominently confirmed in European artwork and statuary around this time. There are also gores inserted to the center front and back panels of the extant gown, but since my reference seems to open down center front, I've omitted the front gore and preserved only the one in the back. For the main body of the gown, I've picked up this vibrant red wool. I've had to choose a partly synthetic wool blend in order to save on cost, since I needed so much material. I have 9 yards here, which should be enough, but I must point out that my fabric is a luxurious 60 inches wide, whereas historically, fabric widths tended to be much narrower and would have required more yardage. Wool was extremely prevalent in the medieval wardrobe, particularly in England, as evidenced by the amount of wool textile remains recovered from archaeological deposits along the Thames. I'm targeting my research specifically towards 15th century England, since the original painting is depicting the legend of St. George, so I'm hazarding a guess that the figures would reflect English styles of dress. Now it's time to mark out the pattern pieces. I haven't been able to find any definitive evidence as to how this was done in the 15th century, but I do know there is evidence of marking out being done with ink by the late 16th and early 17th centuries, so this is the method I've decided to try out. It's worked out surprisingly well. The ink gives a strong, clear line without bleeding or soaking through the wool. We'll see if this still holds true on some of the silk later. I'm using a hand-cut quill to transfer the ink, and if you're curious how to cut one for yourself, I happen to have a video explaining all of the excitement, which I shall link here. Also, in case you're wondering, no, I'm not this tall. I've added an additional 5 inches to the hem to puddle around on the floor, as seems to have been the fashion amongst medieval ladies, who apparently didn't have to do much walking. So now that the main gown panels are all cut out, it's time to start putting it all together. I'm starting with the center back gore, which is inserted by splitting the back panel on the fold of my center line up to the marked point where I want the gore to finish, just a couple of inches below the waistline. Although upon reflection, I think I may have placed it a little bit too low. The gore is attached to the back panel with a running back stitch, that is, a running stitch with a single back stitch taken every couple of stitches to ensure that the seam is nice and secure. Excavated garments prove that the majority of stitching was done with running stitches unless a seam had to take significant strain, and these skirt seams don't have to do that much heavy work. I can completely understand why. Running stitches are much quicker, and there are so many miles of skirt seams ahead. The prospect of saving any bit of time on this process is an enticing one. I'm using a dyed linen thread to do my stitching here, seemingly the most common thread used in the period. Silk was also often used, but was expensive and therefore mostly reserved for more costly materials like silk fabric. There is evidence of cotton threads being used, as well as wool. By the way, most of this archaeological research I've sourced is from this wonderful text published by the Museum of London called Textiles and Clothing 1150-1450, which documents in excruciating detail all sorts of fabrics, threads, dyes, garments, weave patterns, trims, buttons, construction, excavated in the City of London dating to between the 12th and 15th centuries. I highly recommend you have a look through it if you're interested in reconstructing something from this period. It's answered so many of my questions. Once the back gore is set in, it's time to embark on the long journey of seaming together the gown panels. Patterning me is a fool and neglected to put balance marks on these panels, so I'm hoping things don't turn out too chaotic. Pro tip, don't be like me. I had a bit of a think about what type of stitch to use to attach all these panels. 
Since the bodice is very fitted, I didn't think a running stitch would hold it together as strongly as a backstitch would, but backstitching the approximately 32 yards of seaming here sounded like it would take an unreasonable amount of time. In any case, the skirt seams don't need to take any strain and wouldn't need the strength of backstitch. So I came to the decision to start off with a backstitch at the bodice area, then change over to a running stitch a couple of inches below the waistline where the skirt starts to flare. I have come across no contemporary evidence to support this technique, but sometimes it's just nice to experiment with a bit of logic. My handy Museum of London source observes that the average stitch length on Exton artifacts is between 2 to 4 millimeters, so that's what I'm aiming to reproduce. The brilliant part about not needing electricity to sew is that your projects are wonderfully portable. Finally, the center front seam is stitched up at the skirt, but left open from hip level up. This seems to be a common construction method for the 15th century houppelande, which I think the gown in the painting resembles. I'm reinforcing the first couple of inches with back stitches, since there will be a bit of strain here when the garment is put on and removed. The rest of the seam is finished with running stitches. One thing that has become clear to me during this process is that I don't think my pattern quite properly reflects the gown in the painting. See all that gathering at center front there? Yeah. I'm pretty sure there's supposed to be a waist seam in this gown, with the front skirt panels gathered into the bodice instead of the long, continuous gore panels that I initially interpreted. Similar to, as I just mentioned, the 15th century houppelande. So despite my best efforts, the gown I've ended up with isn't quite the same gown from the painting, but since the evidence I've been working with is contemporary, my interpretation isn't necessarily inaccurate, just a slightly different style. So at long last, we have the beginnings of a gown. This is an excellent point for a fitting while all the seams are still unfinished. It's much easier to unpick a bit of backstitching than it is to undo the whole felled seam, so I'm off to go do that now. I think this is a nice interval to stop for part one. Still to come are sleeves, trimmings, buttons, closures, lacing, and a whole lot of felling. Give us a subscribe if that's anything of interest to you, and I shall see you next time for some more historical sewing adventures.